just give you a few seconds to settle in. And while you do, I'll just say good afternoon uh, to everyone here. Welcome panelists and audience members alike. As you settle in, we'll, I'll just say a few words of welcome on behalf of all of us behind the scenes here um, at Force Space. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge that Concordia University's Force Space is located on unceded indigenous lands in downtown Jojage, Montreal as a sort of makerspace for knowledge sharing, building community and facilitating impact since March, Force Space has been producing events and other activities virtually that are accessible, interactive and cross-disciplinary. So working with Concordia's Digital Strategy Initiative and the Office of Research to foster conversations about artificial intelligence, in other words, hosting today's event is really a great example of the realization of our mission. So we're very pleased that you could join us here today. We're very pleased to have been invited to take part. Before passing things off to Vice Provo Digital Strategy and University Librarian Guylaine Boudry, a few procedural notes. This event is being recorded and will be available on our website, which is concordia.ca slash four in the coming days. And if you're on Facebook, um, you can check out the live streaming happening now at cu 4 space We invite you, those of you here with us in the webinar to activate the chat with any commentary throughout. But if you have questions that you would like our moderator to address, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. That would be very much appreciated. So have a great conversation and over to you, Guylaine. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, welcome everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you uh, virtually through those little rectangles uh, to talk about AI. Uh, so yes, uh, we are in the virtual four space uh, today, and we're very happy for the invitation that Anna and her team uh, made to us. Uh, as part of the digital strategy, we, uh, we wanted to contribute to the discussion, to the conversation with uh, our community on AI. And the way we wanted to do this is uh, uh, collaboratively and asking members of our community, what are their questions uh, about AI? And uh, so we had, we, we hired a few students who went around and asked their questions, asked questions about you know, AI. What, did, what are your questions about AI? And we took all those questions and we knocked at the doors of our, we were able to do that kind of things then, uh, we knocked at the doors of our AI researchers and specialists on campus uh, who answered those questions that were recorded and edited in, in four videos. I invite you to, uh, to find them, they are very easy to find and the, the, the production is very well done, we're very proud of the product. And uh, so now we have, uh, this afternoon, we have uh, three of, uh, of them, of those uh, AI researchers, specialists, and we may have a fourth one who will, who will pop up at some point uh, to, to talk with us uh, this afternoon for this uh, round table on artificial intelligence. And, but just before I introduce them to you, as the title of this panel is Ask Us Anything About AI, we thought that uh, this round table could be a big, big round table with all of you. And we invite you to ask your questions. So uh, I, I invite you to think about those questions uh, while I'm going to uh, introduce uh, our panelists and ask my first question. And so it's, as Anna said, it's very easy. You click on the Q&A box, put your questions there and we'll take one after the other at any time during the session. So uh, while you are thinking and writing your questions, I'm going to uh, present our panelists and ask the first question. Uh, so I'll start with uh, Brigitte Jomar. Bonjour Brigitte. Uh, Brigitte is honorary Concordia University Research Chair in Optimization of Communication Networks. Uh, she's a professor in the Department of Computer Science and Software Engineering. And she's the Chief Scientist of Computer Research Institute of Montreal, Le CRIM. Uh, Jan Gaël Gaenek, bonjour Jan Gaël, uh, Canada Research Chair in Empirical Software Engineering, uh, for the ILT, the Internet of Things. And Gael Jan is, uh, uh, Jan Gael, sorry, uh, is a professor at the Department of Computer Science and uh, Software Engineering. And we have uh, Jason Lewis. Hi, Jason. Uh, Concordia University Research Chair in Computational Media and the Indigenous Future Imaginary. 
is the director of the Indigenous Futures Research Center, a professor in the Department of Design and Computational Arts, and a member of the Indigenous Directions Leadership Council. So welcome, and thank you very much for agreeing to, uh, to be part of this roundtable today. So as our, uh, uh, our uh, friends and colleagues are thinking of their questions, I would like uh, each one of you to take three, four minutes to talk to us about your research. Please present your research. What are you answering when your nephew or your, one of your children is asking you, what are you doing uh, about AI in your research? Uh, so I'll ask uh, Brigitte to start, please. So uh, thank you, uh, Guylaine. So, um, so I'm a researcher in uh, computer science software engineering. So my uh, core expertise is uh, what we call large scale optimization and uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, what it means, I'm uh, designing, developing uh, algorithms with uh, some requirements. So, so either in terms of uh, solutions or in terms of uh, speed or in terms of uh, storage. And uh, in, uh, I'm applying those uh, design in different uh, contexts. So one of them is uh, networking. So I guess you have all heard about 5G uh, networks, networks that will be uh, fully uh, automated even when the, the traffic is uh, changing over the time. So that's where we are uh, applying uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, trying to predict the traffic and uh, while predicting the traffic, anticipating on reallocating in an automated way the resources of a network. So making sure that whenever you have a call or you want to see a video, then you have the best possible quality at uh, any time. I'm also uh, designing uh, algorithm in the context of uh, logistics. So currently uh, working with a company taking care of uh, the deliveries, all those uh, small parcels that you are ordering on Amazon. So the, the big change between six months ago and today in the, those uh, parcel last mile delivery, it's the number of parcels and their size. While before it was uh, big items, today it's uh, more items, but smaller ones. And where we use artificial intelligence is to uh, optimize uh, those uh, deliveries, trying to predict the time it will take to go from one location to the next, depending on the weather, depending on the, the traffic, but also uh, estimating the uh, delivery times, depending whether you have to deliver a fridge and there is an elevator, uh, you have to go to the floor 20, or you have to deliver uh, one table, four chairs, and you have to climb uh, five uh, uh, stairs and, and so on. So we are uh, developing uh, those tools using uh, machine learning so that uh, we can deliver the largest number of parcels uh, in one day given a, a, a given fleet of uh, trucks. So that's for my uh, research. Thank you very much, Brigitte. Um, maybe uh, Jan Gael, you can go next. Thank you very much. Thank you, Guylaine. Uh, first, I will say hello to everyone, to all the participants, and it's very nice to not meet you, but at least to be here together. Um, my research is actually on software engineering and um, the Internet of Things. So uh, Internet of Things is, you know, those the sensors and actuators and all those things that you have now in your house and uh, that we have in our cars that also exist in our industries. And the problem that I'm trying to tackle is how do we... Uh, evolve those kind of uh, systems. Because all those systems actually are made of uh, software. I mean, they are made of, of course, hardware, but also they are running a lot of software. And because of their size, because of their uh, energy consumption, because of the in, uh, uh, internet connection, uh, they, might, they might be and they will be and there has been problems with those uh, devices. So I'm doing some research about testing those devices, about uh, deployment of, of, of new software version. Uh, with security, and uh, part of this research involved using machine learning uh, algorithms to uh, to deal with large amount of data and to find patterns in this data. So, voila. Thank you. Thank you, Jan Gael, and over to you, Jason. Ah, 
you're muted, Jason. Rookie mistake. Okay. <laughs> so thanks, uh, Ghislaine, for inviting me to be here and be part of this conversation. And I uh, also want to echo Jan's uh, uh, thanks to our audience for joining us today. Uh, so my research centers on the general question of how AI and any technology really reflects the cultural context in which it is designed and developed and specifically how indigenous worldviews are not well captured in current AI system designs. For instance, many indigenous communities have ways of acquiring, communicating and deploying knowledge that emphasizes relationality and locality. So relationality means that knowledge is not useful, if it's not understood in the context of how it is connected to the entities, human and non-human, uh, that give rise to and are impacted by that knowledge. And locality means that the knowledge is understood in relationship to a particular territory and those that uh, inhabit it. So AI systems, uh, computer science, engineering science in general, relies very heavily on abstracting general patterns and principles from experiment and data, with one consequence being that the texture of the wants and needs of specific communities gets lost, particularly if those communities are relatively small in population. Another consequence is that all manner of assumptions uh, must be made in order to achieve those abstractions, and those assumptions are We lost, we lost you, Jason. I, I hope it's not the power. I sorry. Would have... Oh yes, we lost you. Oh, oh. oh but you're back. <laughs> That's weird. Okay. Wow, I'm at Concordia. I'm like plugged into a hard line. Oh, interesting. interesting. Okay, so Probably, where'd you lose yeah. me? Only, only 20 seconds, not even 10 seconds that we Okay. Yes. So, you were talking about locality and... Uh, right, okay. Computer. Right, so uh, AI systems and computer science, engineering, science in general, relies heavily on abstracting general patterns and principles from experiment and data, with one consequence being that the texture of the wants and needs of specific communities get lost, um, particularly if those communities are relatively small in population. Another consequence is that all matter of assumptions must be made in order to achieve those abstractions, and those assumptions are culturally biased. Uh, we now have ample evidence of how such biases infect many of our current AI systems, at least the ones that deal with people, resulting in real harm being done to real people. So I helped start the Indigenous Protocol call and Artificial Intelligence Workshops to collaborate with Indigenous groups to help them understand the technology and to imagine how the technology can be built to better reflect their priorities. Uh, we're also trying to build capacity within the community so that we can build these technologies ourselves and shape them to better integrate into our circle of relationships. So the working group, group released a position paper last August. Uh, it's an international group of 35 indigenous scholars, scientists, engineers, designers, artists, and community knowledge holders uh, looking at these questions. Um, and I uh, encourage people to go check it out at indigenousai.net. Hmm. Thank you very much. Very uh, three different perspectives, uh, complementary and and really interesting. So I, and I wrote that uh, Concordia just lost power. <laughs> I, I suppose that we're good. We can continue, but uh, that's interesting. And uh, and also and I'll put the uh, the link to uh, the videos if you are interested. So uh, yes, prepare your questions, my friends. Prepare your questions. And I'll go with my my first. Uh, can, can you please talk, any of us, uh, any of you, uh, would you please uh, talk to us about data and AI? We often associate AI with big data. What about big quality data and AI? What, what is your uh, reflection about, uh, about data in relation to AI? Whoever would like to. I can start. Uh, yeah. yeah, I can start. So I think uh, data is um, it's a big um, ingredient of uh, artificial intelligence, and sometimes it's uh, underestimated. So when um, so as a researcher working with different industrial uh, partners for the last uh, two years, everybody wants uh, AI. And then you ask them, what's about your data? And they say, don't worry, we have plenty of them. And then what is typical is that you start the project and discover that, yes, they have some data, but not the one that you need. So to give you an example, uh, back to uh, this example I was giving you, introducing my research, 
So you want to predict the time it will take for a given uh, delivery, one table, two chairs. And uh, you don't know whether it's easy to park. You don't know uh, how easy to, it, it is to access the, the location where you have to do the delivery. And uh, you need the data for that. Huh? So the, the company, I, uh, we are developing this application had no data at the beginning, uh, only the, um, the, the time that the, the, the timestamp of when the driver goes out of the, the trunk and when it goes back to the trunk, but that's not enough to, uh, to predict. So first a step of the project, and it lasted at least uh, six months and will probably uh, go on for a while, was to, to collect the data, otherwise there is nothing you can do. Remember that AI, it's about identifying patterns in a given set of data. So for sure you, you, you do need uh, uh, data. Okay, so I could uh, give you other examples, but I'm going to leave uh, my colleagues give their uh, own uh, comments for the data and uh, AI. Thank you, Jason, Yang Gain. So, yeah, I mean, so we I'm looking at data from a similar but also kind of different perspective, which is, you know, many of the issues that we've seen in the last, say, five years around um, the bias that is expressed by uh, facial recognition systems, by different systems for evaluating things like mortgages or resumes and stuff like that. Um, a, a lot of that comes from bad data, right? Meaning that the data that was fed into these systems had those biases in it and that the people who built the systems didn't do the work of trying to correct for those biases. Um, and so I think that it's, um, it, it's it clearly, as Rishi said, it's you know, central uh, to have good quality data, but I think that part of the conversation now needs to be how we define good quality. So there's sort of kind of functional quality, which I think was what Brigitte is talking about. It's like, there's just not kind of the data points that you need in the quantity that you need in order for the, the algorithms uh, you know, to do the job that they need to do. But there's also a question, again, when we're, you know, uh, when we're talking about issues that touch on human activity, um, there's a question of having to actually look deeply at these data sets to try to figure out if they are, if they are sort of expressing uh, uh, both contemporary and historical biases. So Kate Crawford from the AI Now Institute uh, in New York has a really great series of papers and lectures where she uh, she looks deeply, her and her crew look very deeply into some of these commonly used data sets that are used to train systems and sort of experiment with systems. And there's sort of like categorization in some of them that go back to the late 1800s, right? Because what happens as we go along is data sets get fed into new data sets, which get fed into new data sets. And up until now, you know, the field hasn't done a very good job, in fact, frankly, a really horrible job of like doing the deep research to actually really look at that data, where it came from and how it got structured. Because you can imagine the data was structured in say the late 1800s or the early 1900s, when for instance, in the US, Jim Crow was still the law, um, that there are some pretty serious biases in there about how people are described. Uh, but the work hasn't been done to clean that out. And so we're all we're all living with the result of those infections now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so maybe we we got a a very good question uh, from uh, Simon, uh, who's saying that, uh, and maybe uh, Jan, you can start with this one. Uh, and it's related to data and uh, the quality of data, the structure of data, the structure of data, Jason, as you as you put it. So uh, Simon or Simon, I don't know, uh, is asking how much of the issues is really data specific versus the annotation of, the, of that data, the metadata, I guess, of that data and the interpretation of the outputs. Data is inherently inert. It is what it is. It is the meaning we assign to the data, which is normally the problem. Jan, do you want to, to start on that one? Or do you have a comment on, on, uh, on this uh, assertion and, and also an answer to that question? Yes, yes, thank you. Um, yes, it's actually a very interesting question because the, there is, I think, a miscomprehension in the public about uh, what is really data. It's like 
data is not actually inert. Data is changing a lot all the time. Mm -hmm. So of, of course, data sets that are being used, let's say, to train a machine learning algorithm on, you know, on, on faces, there will be like a huge amount of visage or, or face in this data set. But that, that's the problem, actually. The problem comes from if the data set stays static, then the machine learning algorithm that would be generated from the data set will not be representative of the current state of the population. So we don't want this data to be inert. We want this data to evolve and to actually, as Jason mentioned as well, we want it to, to evolve in the positive sense. You know, as a, as a society evolves, we want the data set to evolve as well. So we, sh we should not keep the data set uh, inert. And um, the data also should be, I mean, what we say, uh, I want to, to say it because that's something we, we say often in our domain, it's like garbage in, garbage out. So of course, if you feed an algorithm with some data that is nonsensical for whatever purpose, what you will get is a machine learning algorithm that doesn't make any sense or doesn't label your data in, in a correct way. Uh, so the, the label are very important and uh, it's of, often underestimated the amount of effort that goes into labeling data. Mm -hmm. uh, captchas, I mean, everybody's familiar with those captchas, right? This, you know, this, this little uh, icon that says, uh, am I a robot? And then you have to click on the button to or, uh, click on images to tell people that, to tell the system that you are not a robot. Those captchas, while they work, is because they have been labeled images that has been labeled by many hundred, if not thousands of people in the past. And they keep on being updated and, and, and labeled as, as we speak now. And uh, what you might not know is that when you actually answer a captcha, some of those captchas are not captchas. Some of those captchas are actually you training the system. Uh -huh. so, so the captcha actually expects you that you were going to give the good answer. And actually, no matter the answer you will give, you don't know, but no matter the answer you, answer you will give, you will be uh, welcome into the system because they are actually using your answer to train this data. So we are actually both the user and the labeler of this data. So um, uh, yes, label and data are, are very important and, and they are key to this algorithm, machine learning algorithm. Good. Sam, I, I saw your question, I'll come to it very soon, and I encourage other participants to write their questions in the, either in the chat or in the Q&A uh, box. Uh, but can one of you explain to us, when you say the data sets need to evolve, what do you mean by that? When you, you talked about label, you, you talked about uh, structured data, how the data set can evolve because the data that we collected, let's say, uh, let's say uh, the data being uh, the text, the full text of the New York Times at the end of the 19th century. Okay? The, the content won't change. Uh, the content won't change and even the metadata and the structure, the title will continue to be a title, the paragraph will continue to be a paragraph and so on. So when you say that the data set needs to evolve, what, what do you mean by that? Well, I can uh, I can go on on this uh, uh, data that are uh, that are in need of evolving. I'm not going to uh, maybe uh, go ahead with your uh, example of uh, New York Times, but more with networks because I'm more familiar <laughs> with that uh, area. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so uh, you know, in the context of uh, networks, the the companies are uh, worried about what they call the the life cycles of. Uh, Machine, uh, machine learning, uh, meaning that uh, let's say if you develop today an uh, AI algorithms to uh, uh, do the uh, automated allocation of resources uh, in a predictive way, in a proactive way in a network, uh, is it still going to work from uh, uh, five years from now? And if you want to, 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 be, uh, to have those networks still working with the software that we are developing today, and in particular to the AI software, then you have to make sure that you are uh, updating, renewing those data. That is the, the traffic that we have today in terms of a distribution between, uh, I don't know, remote surgery, uh, automated, autonomous vehicle, uh, gaming, and so on. Uh, you, if you take a snapshot today, it's not going to be the same tomorrow uh, in six months and in one year. So if you want to use the, the data to predict the, the traffic and do a proactive uh, allocation of the resources, for sure you, you need to have those data evolving over the time. 
And in particular, in the context of the machine learning algorithm, uh, you can do a continuous uh, training, as uh, Jan uh, just explained, or uh, as it is uh, usually costly, because that's the most costly part uh, sometimes, uh, the training, you have to decide when you need to retrain your system so that the conclusion, the patterns that uh, you output with the machine learning algorithm uh, is still uh, valid, has still a good uh, accuracy. So one of the, the question today uh, of, uh, so the telecom industry, but I'm sure that it's uh, true for other uh, industries, is when do you need to uh, retrain? When do you need to collect? Uh, should you do it in a continuous way? Should, do, should you do it every two months? Uh, because there is a cost. And in addition, people are worried about sustainable uh, system today. So uh, I don't want to, to become uh, the system to become bigger and bigger so that at the end, the energy issue becomes uh, an issue. But that's another question. Okay. So, Thank you, Brigitte. Uh, 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 Ian or Jason, do, would you like to add something to this on the evolution of data sets? And before, uh, maybe before uh, giving the, the mic to Jason, because I'm sure Jason had a lot of interesting uh, example to give. Actually, I, I like your example, Guylaine, about the New York Times, because uh, being a, a second an English speaker as a learner, I learned English as my second language, uh, I can see how the language evolved. You know, in, in textbook, we learn about the proper English. Uh -huh. But when you go into, when you come to Canada or USA, you, you speak with people and people don't speak like in the New York Times. They speak, you know, like a different language. I mean, it's, a, it's English, <laughs> right? But it's not, it's not like the New York Times English. And I think that's a very good example of how data should evolve to follow, follow the trends, follow how people evolve, how society evolve. Uh, because if they don't, if, if we keep, if, if we build a system on the New York Times from 1900, this system will not be able to recognize interesting things today. I it will see. be outdated. Basically, the system will be outdated because the data is outdated. Yeah. So if we want to ask a question through an AI system with a data set that goes, let's say, for a century of publication of the New York Times, we will need behind some, the librarians will say, thesaurus to map the different concepts so we get the right answers uh, to, uh, to the questions we have so we can cross uh, all, all the data set we have, which is over time. That's a very interesting concept. Jason, do you want to, uh, to add something to that? I, you're, you're muted. <laughs> My connection's dropped out twice now, so I'm actually not yeah. quite sure where we're at. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry. We were, we're still about uh, talking about the, if, how the data sets can evolve. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, I think the responses uh, I heard, I think I heard all of Jan's and some of Brigitte's, I, you know, I think they were great responses. I think that, you know, again, both in sort of like kind of purely functional senses, but also in terms of, you know, kind of the sort of the social reality and consequences of using this data, it's the same thing, hmm. right? Is that, um, and that's a huge, that's, a, I think, a, a big part, that's a, that's a nice way to describe some of the problems we're seeing right now is that the, the data has not actually evolved, right? Or the data that's being used has not actually evolved to reflect the social reality that we live in in 2020, right? Or at least the, I would say the ideal of the social reality, the social reality that we want, yeah. right? And one that we have is still very problematic. Uh, so the data that we're collecting now will still be problematic. It's not like we're in a, we're in a place now where the data that's being collected is clean you know, because it's not from 50 years ago. So okay. I think it's incredibly important as well from those uh, from those respects. And it's actually, I think, one of the nice areas of, I think, kind of convergence of concern between, you know, people who are really looking at the systems from an engineering perspective, a functional perspective, mm -hmm. and people who are looking at these systems in terms of their social consequences, is that I think, you know, to me, you know, with, you know, undergraduate training in computer science, you know, you know, that, that, that as a good programmer, as a good engineer, like you should want to have good data, right? That should be part of your professional, like pride and, 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 and thinking about yourself as a good computer scientist or a good software engineer is that you are putting good data into your system. 
so that you good, get good results out of it. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, and that's what we want too, right? It's just that we're, I think at the moment, we're looking at different definitions of what constitutes good, right? And I think the challenge is how to bring those into conversation with each other. They're not in opposition to each other, yeah. right? It's how to bring them into conversation with each other uh, so that the sorts of things that I think should be addressed you know, become part of what it means to actually engineer a system properly and well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, your your image, uh, oh, for fuck's sake. Jason, I don't know if we're going to lose you for a fifth time. So Simon, Simon, I, 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 it was a very good question. Thank you very much for asking it. Uh, Sam is asking the following, hello everyone. What is being done to address apprehension for lay people who fall for conspiracy theories about AI. Um, there is, of course, no shortage for any branch of AI these days. <laughs> yes, you're right. So, is any of you is inspired by by that uh, by that question? Thank you, Sam, for asking it. Um, maybe I can start. If uh... yes, thank you, Jan. Yes, sir. You're welcome. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> well. Well, my, my, my answer, I mean, the beginning of my answer will be very simple is that having those kind of MA session, it's part of, of uh, the education, right, of, of everyone and not to be afraid of, of AI. I mean, AI is, not, uh, AI is not going to take over the world tomorrow. <laughs> I can swear on my life. <laughs> but uh, yeah, education is very important. Education is very important, but also, uh, education in the sense of recognizing that people are afraid, or, or, and, and sometimes rightly so, afraid of, of machine learning and AI systems. Um, I think also one thing that we should do and, and we can do as, as, a, as a citizen is to question, okay, question the decision being made when algorithms are involved. And that's something that's very important is not, or, or try not to uh, accept any conclusion taken by an algorithm without having some person explaining you why this decision was made. Okay, mm -hmm. so AI is as, as wonderful application, machine learning has wonderful applications, uh, but there should always be some kind of, of uh, uh, human in the loop, as we say in computer science. There should be someone who interprets the results, someone who is there to explain, and someone who is accountable for the results. So I think Jason at the beginning, uh, maybe I recall wrongly, but you, you took this example of, uh, people, you know, sending their CV and they got rejected um, because of some machine learning system tell, oh, no, this CV is not good. Mm. Uh, well, there should be someone accountable for these decisions. So someone where this person who got their CV rejected can say, well, okay, but please explain me why. And, and of course, there can be very, very good reasons. Like it's not to say that machine learning or AI are evil, not at all. They could be very valid reasons, but there should be someone there to explain and to take responsibility. So if there is no valid reason, then this person should say, ah, sorry, the system made a mistake for whatever reason, most likely the data, <laughs> and should, this person should be responsible to correct the mistake. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ian. Anything to add on that? Good. Uh, we have another question, a question to uh, the three panelists. Have you collaborated with mental health or addictions with finding patterns on inclusion or categorizing? Okay, I can uh, take that one. Um, so I've not worked directly on mental health or addictions, but I'm going to uh, still give you an example that uh, uh, show you that it is possible and it can, uh, um, and uh, AI can help. Uh, so, for example, there are some uh, works today on uh, trying to evaluate the evolution of uh, diseases like the, the Parkinson disease uh, with a mix of um, uh, images and uh, uh, video and, uh, and voice. That is, you, um, I'm not a specialist of the Parkinson's uh, disease, but what a specialist would uh, tell you is that uh, based on the way the uh, patient is uh, speaking, the, the, the speed, the way it works, the way he is going to, to walk uh, or the way he's going to behave or to stand, then you can uh, uh, give some uh, uh, diagnostics on uh, how the 
the Parkinson disease is evolving. So back to the, your questions of uh, mental health and uh, addiction, I'm pretty sure that uh, those uh, research where we mixed uh, uh, different uh, types of information, that is uh, your voice, the way you speak, the way you behave, the way you walk, uh, could definitely uh, help uh, in that context. And possibly, I'm just not aware of it, there might be already some uh, studies uh, on it uh, using AI. I, I would really not be uh, surprised uh, that there are already uh, ongoing diseases, or ongoing uh, studies. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, one question I had, is there, is there a topic or a question that the public in general don't know about AI? Or you see that it's, it's, it's an important question, but it's never addressed. It's never discussed in the, uh, in the general press about AI and that you think we should know. I can start again if... Uh, yes, go ahead. Uh, but, but, but I don't want to monopolize the conversation. Oh, no, that's fine, I think. <laughs> Yes, I, I think a major question, and it, it follows up the previous question by Sam, uh, I think a major question that people should ask is that, what is really AI? Uh -huh. Because we have all these fantasies, you know, based on books and films and movies and whatever, you know, where AI is this kind of super intelligence will eventually take over the world and, and you know, what, <laughs> whatever, you, whatever movie you watched. But uh, it, actually, it is not, I mean, there are different branches of AIs first, and the AI we are talking much more about to, to, nowadays, the, the AI really applied nowadays in hospital or industry uh, or, or cities is actually what we call statistical AI. So that's why data is so important because the statistical AI needs a lot of data to apply statistical methods, mathematics, on this data and find patterns, find patterns in this data. But this statistical AI will not, is not intelligent in the sense of intelligence, like as we, as we conceive it, like we are intelligent, this statistical AI is not intelligent. So when I hear like my, for instance, my daughters talking to me about how an AI system beat a chess, chess master, a grandmaster at chess, mm -hmm. or uh, more recently a, a grandmaster of Go, and they tell me, oh, look, this computer is so smart. I'm telling them, no, it's not smart. It's just very good at what it's doing. So this AI system is very good at playing chess or very good at playing Go. But put this system in front of a cat or in front of a kitchen or in front of a car and it cannot do anything. It doesn't even conceive what, what is being in front of it. So these systems are not intelligent and they are not going to take over the world. Uh -huh. So understanding what really AI is. Yeah, absolutely. Or Jason, would you like to add anything to that? Yeah, I think, I mean, a question I wish they would ask is, you know, what are the assumptions that are built into the architecture and the algorithms, mm. right? Um, like, because they all have assumptions, right? Every, every, every architecture, every algorithm starts with some assumptions about the world, starts with assumptions about what kind of data is important and what isn't, um, and a whole host of other assumptions. And that there's, I think, along with, you know, what Jan's talking about, about these, you know, kind of these imaginings of AI that come from kind of popular culture that's, you know, nothing like most of what's being worked on right now. You know, there's also this tendency to think, uh, you know, because it's presented sort of, you know, as, as a science to think that they're, you know, it's only, it's just operating on some truth, right? It's just, it's just pure math. Um, and so that it, that, you know, there aren't assumptions, right? It's just working cleanly like that, but, you know, Everybody who builds these systems know uh, that there's a whole host of assumptions that goes into building them. You don't start from scratch every time and nobody ever started from scratch, right? <laughs> um, and uh, that's a hard one, I think, to educate the public to ask, but I think it's a corollary uh, to what was being said earlier about what Yan was saying about being able to ask who's responsible, right? It sort of runs along with that same sort of approach is of like, you know, who is responsible and then, you know, what assumptions about the world is the system making? Because you can only actually understand the results if you understand those assumptions, yeah. uh, as well as the data that went into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
So we, we have two questions. Um, Brandif uh, is asking uh, Shoshana Zuboff's book, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, warns us that our data is being collected and sold by and for machine learning algorithms in ways most people are completely unaware of. Transparency in how this data is collected and implemented in AI seems to be the agreed upon remedy. How does your work respond to this issue? Brigitte, would you like to start with that? Yeah, I can start on that. So um, first of all, um, in uh, many countries, there are already some uh, laws in order to uh, protect uh, your uh, data on the way they are collected and the way they are uh, used. Uh, so for example, if we are talking about sensitive or personal uh, data, then uh, a company, uh, an organization cannot uh, freely use them and in particular sell them without your approval. So uh, I would say that be careful when you create a, an account on a Facebook and they ask you, did you read the rules? And you say yes without reading them. Well, if you don't want your data to be uh, sold uh, uh, to uh, anybody, then make sure that whenever you agree for something, you do read those uh, small letters and make sure that you don't, uh, with your uh, approval, agree that your personal data can be used for any purpose by the company. The, the, the main reason I would say that why this is happening, it's because most people are not aware and not very careful when they share their, uh, their data. Uh, in addition, uh, I think those laws sometimes are uh, becoming a little bit outdated. So if we are talking about uh, Quebec, that's a little bit the case currently. And there is a new uh, project, uh, uh, the law 64, that is going to be soon uh, adopted uh, by the Quebec government that will be an update of the current uh, law on the protection of uh, personal data. Mm -hmm. Uh, so uh, I believe we are well protected, uh, but maybe uh, we need to make the people more aware of uh, when they are not careful with uh, their data and uh, without uh, being aware of it, uh, giving rights to companies or organizations to use uh, those data for uh, any purpose. Yeah, I, I, I think if there's a you know, there's a, a cultural change, change that needs to happen in, say, in how we educate our young people, right? And uh, I mean, we, we people our age need it too, but I mean, I think it needs to be part of the basic education about this, this thing called data that, you know, that, you know, one of the terms that's used in social science is a data shadow, yeah. right? So it's, the, it's sort of the collection of data that's been collected by you or collected about you like over the course of your life and lives on in different ways. And it, you know, up until, you know, say the last 20 years, 15 years, it, you know, it's been squirreled away in different databases and it was still problematic in some sense, but not on the scale it is now. And that we have to teach people that, you know, their data shadow is something that they need to guard in the same way that we teach children now not to, you know, not to use their real name if they're underage in, you know, online chat spaces right, or not to give out their address, right? It needs to be on that level of like, okay, there's this thing <laughs> that belongs to you that people out there are, are being predatory about, right? That they're trying to get that data and to use that in data in ways that, you know, I would argue are sort of kind of minimally beneficial to you, right? It might save you a few cents here and there, but actually have the potential to be quite damaging to you. Um, and that uh, we need to have that kind of mindset about it, you know, um, so that laws like the Law 64, you know, and other regulatory schemes um, can, you know, actually have some chance of, of, of making a difference. Hmm. Yeah, I, it reminds me that uh, when we started with the digital strategy, uh, we sent a, uh, we administered a, a survey to all our students. And we were surprised, yes, a bit surprised to read that uh, only 12%, 12% of our students were telling us that they know 
what Concordia is doing with their data. So it's certainly a personal, um, a personal responsibility. When we click, I agree, we need to know what does that mean? And the way, with the regulation that they, uh, they passed one year and a half ago in Europe, uh, we all learned uh, a lot uh, about, about those uh, implications. But it's also responsibility on the side of the organizations to uh, structure the data and inform members of their community, certainly. Yeah, actually, Ghislaine, I just want to add one thing I, I forgot. Yes, so part of the importance of having that education is so that, that then citizens, you know, actually advocate for laws to protect that. Exactly. Yeah. Right, because right now I think it seems very different, di distant, and abstract to people, and so it's hard to muster support for legislation around it. So, yeah, that's a very good point. And and in Europe, it did work the GDPR because of one at the beginning, it was one deputy of the Green Party in in Germany who brought together all the colleagues, and they did that against. Microsoft, Google, Amazon, etc., and you know it's now in force. So it's it can be seen as something that is gigantic, but no, it's it's certainly possible. Uh, Anna is telling me that if you prefer to voice your question, we can unmute you very very easily. So it's either uh, maybe the easiest way is to use uh, the uh, the little hand. Uh, in uh, in Zoom, and I'll see it, and uh, we will unmute your mic, and you'll be able to simply talk to us if you prefer it that way. So either you write your question in the chat or the Q and A, or you do it with uh, the little hand, and uh, Anna uh, will unmute you. Okay. Uh, so we have uh, another question from uh, Simon on a more technical level. What do you see as the greatest challenge in AI over the next couple of years? In contrast, where do you expect AI to make the greatest advances in the next couple of years? So the greatest challenge and the greatest advances. So I can start uh, maybe. So the, 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 the first question about the, the greatest uh, challenge. So. I don't know if what I'm going to say is going to be the greatest challenge, but it's one of them at least. Uh, so I, I think it's uh, make sure that we uh, apply uh, AI in a, in a good way. That is, we have already uh, seen the uh, usage of AI uh, uh, questionable uh, because people want to go uh, too fast. So, for example, uh, I heard about um, uh, a system that was evaluating the, uh, the, the uh, kind of help that uh, uh, old people would need uh, uh, and so on. And uh, with, um, together with uh, a rule that it was the, the program or the, the system that would decide alone with no human intervention. So of course it uh, very quickly was a disaster and it had to be a change. Huh? And I guess in the newspapers, in the news, uh, you can see uh, some criticisms of AI where people wanted to go too fast, where maybe not very knowledgeable about AI and then have uh, went through uh, some mis misuse of uh, AI. So I think it's going to be one of the challenge with the system that are going to get uh, uh, older and uh, if back to what I said at the beginning, we don't retrain the system, we don't update the data, then uh, you know the, the the system may not be uh, good uh, anymore, and we have to be uh, careful uh, about his uh, usage. Huh? So back to what Jan said, I think we have to be careful about always having a human responsible for it. Uh, and uh, maybe in charge of making sure that it's always updated so that the, the system still uh, has a valid uh, conclusions. So. Thank you, Brigitte. Thank you, Miriam and Jan for the links that you put in the chat box. Jan, do you have uh, uh, any thoughts to share with us on the challenges and, uh, and uh, biggest um, uh, advances in the next couple of years for AI? Uh, yeah, there will be a lot of challenges. Um, so some of them will be like, as Bridget mentioned, like uh, more on the use of AI and, and in which context we use them. But there are also a lot of challenges in the purely mathematical, you know, improving the algorithm, 
making them uh, especially transparent and explainable. So right now there is a big push, uh, and I mean due to some concern about like the use of AI, there is a big push in uh, in developing algorithms that can explain their decision. Because uh, so far statistical AI is a, often is a black box. So you put data in. I mean after training, you put data in into the black box, and the black box will give you an answer. But now there is a push to actually have algorithms that can explain why and how come they reach this answer among all the possible answers that have been given. So it's called explainable AI. Mm. And it's a part of the transparency and accountability that we want to, to see from uh, machine learning and AI algorithms. And I think that there will be a big, uh, I mean, there should be big challenges in, in uh, uh, reaching those, uh, those uh, explainable AI. Mm -hmm. To go beyond the uh, black box. Exactly, absolutely. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Jason. I'd, I'd like to start with uh, with the next uh, with the next question on trust and responsibility, and an hour to other panelists could certainly I, uh, add to that um, about uh, who is responsible for what is happening with uh, an AI system and when there's a decision that is that is made. For example, in the case of a car accident, and and I'd like you to. Uh, uh, to develop because I, I know I, I heard you saying uh, something about, uh, about that. I know that you have uh, you did some thinking on that. Uh, what kind of framework you think we need as a society to face the challenges and opportunities of AI in terms of legal system, education, regulation? What? How do you see this framework for uh, to face all these challenges that are linked to trust? and responsibility? Well, it's a, it's a complicated framework, right? I mean, we're just at the beginning of really getting a sense or, you know, just how many aspects of our lives this technology touches on and will touch on as we go forward. Uh, and that, um, you know, that it's, it, I think we're just at kind of this, this, this uh, transition point over the last couple of years where we've realized like, okay, this is not just a technical challenge, mm -hmm. right? That is, it's a social challenge. It's a legislation, legislative challenge. Um, and that it's, it's, it's no longer something that we can just leave to the engineers, right? Like we, we need the engineers to continue to, you know, work on the big problems, you know, like uh, Jan uh, was talking about, but, um, this issue of what Brigitte was talking about is how do you how do we actually, you know, try to try to push this technology in a direction that's for our good, is going to require that kind of effort, like multi pronged effort to do, and we need to get it in our heads that that's that's the kind of effort that's needed, right? It's not a technical, it's not a technical thing, and you know the industry and academia has responded a bit with these various, you know, the Montreal Declaration and you know things like that, but. You know, honestly, I mean, some of the ones that I've read, I'm very skeptical of them, um, you know, in the same way that, you know, the UN right, you know, Declaration on the Rights and Responsibilities of, you know, for human rights and for indigenous rights, like, you know, they have some impact, right? But they're not legally binding, right? They don't bind those companies who sign on them to actually change their behavior at all. Um, and I think we're transitioning out of that period where we can, we can find that acceptable. And I also think as academics, we're transitioning out of a period where, you know, we can just be like, I'm just in my lab making the system and I don't need to worry about the consequences of it. You know, the same way that we already do that with other kinds of research. Um, you know, one of the things that we talked about uh, before was, um, you know, that, uh, you know, sort of really looking at this as an engineering discipline, you know, because, you know, we don't let engineers build bridges with substandard material, right? Like we have, we have professionalization, licensing, uh, and legislation, right? Uh, and professional sanctions that all combine together to make it so that we live in a pretty good time where there's very few bridges that fall down, which is kind of amazing, right? I mean, I don't know, the Romans did it. So, but anyways, um, you know, but we don't have anywhere near that kind of sort of uh, oversight and professionalization around this technology, right? At least that I see. Um, and I think we're getting to the point where we realize that's a really big problem. 
and that it's both a problem for the field. So internally, you know, that, that software engineering, computer science needs to do something to address it in terms of both how they educate professionals, but mm -hmm. also what kind of licensing the professionals need, you know? Um, and I know it, it slows down the, the rate of experimentation, it slows down the rate of innovation, but we've had, you know, a number of decades of like just sort of full steam ahead innovation, you know, it, it's, it's okay now to be like, okay, let's slow it down to figure out how we can put all these different things into place so that, um, you know, so we don't have AI systems fall down and, and hurt people, right? Which is what they're doing now, right? At least some subset of them. And what we've seen is that it's not, it's not a, it's not a bug right? Like there's, there's, there's kind of some intrinsic things about how these systems are being developed that we keep seeing the same sorts of biases crop up in different ways, right? And we can talk about, you know, and I think it's a good conversation to talk about why that is the case, you know, and I think somebody put in the chat, you know, Ruha Benjamin's book, uh, The New Jim Code, where she kind of goes into some of the, you know, some of the, the conversation about why these things are structural. It's not a question of whether an individual engineer is racist, for instance. That's not the question. I don't care, actually, right? What I care is if um, they are building systems that, uh, that perpetuate and actually make worse certain structural inequalities that have been built into our society, so. Thank you, Jason. And Mili uh, Yang Dimanche is uh, put a, uh, a link about that AI initiative uh, at Dawson College and the education space, something that uh, uh, some of our participants may be interested in, in uh, having a look. Uh, anything to add, Jan and Brigitte, on the, the trust and responsibility? Who is responsible for that car accident, for example? <laughs> For the car accident, uh, I don't think that we have yet an answer. I think it's uh, a little bit as if the, the, the legislation uh, is a little bit behind the technology. Uh, indeed, for the, uh, the, the allowing um, autonomous cars uh, on, uh, on roads, uh, I think the technology is more or less ready today. What is uh, the reason why we don't move ahead with uh, more autonomous cars in our streets and, uh, and roads, it's mainly because we have no answer or not yet clear answer to those questions. Who is responsible if there is a car accident? So it's funny to see somehow that uh, the reason why it's not there, it's because legislation has been uh, underestimated the speed of the, the technology. Uh, one one more comment, uh, especially looking at uh, what is published in the in the chat, is that um, I, I believe that yes, that's true. There is uh, ethic uh, courses offered to uh, uh, students, uh, undergraduate students. Maybe we need to have um, a special ethic course for uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. I believe that it goes beyond what we teach in those uh, general purpose uh, courses about uh, ethics with uh, AI and uh, making sure that people feel responsible when they design, develop those AI ML uh, algorithm that they understand uh, the full uh, usage of them uh, and that they feel responsible for how they will be used huh? and make sure that the people who will use those uh, algorithm do understand the limits of those algorithms. Hmm. Can I just add something? Yes, of course. You know, I'm not a lawyer. It's not my focus of study. But, <laughs> you know, it, it, I'm always puzzled by this, like, question of, like, who is responsible, right? Mm -hmm. It's actually, to me, it's actually pretty clear. It's the people who built the system, uh -huh. right? And now you could decide which, which person or group of people who built it are specifically responsible. But I think part of the reason why we have this question of who is responsible is because as noted by Brigitte, right? The sort of the legislation and the ability of policymakers to think about this technology is lagging far behind and the companies that are pushing it, you know, let's talk about the self-driving car stuff. They have a really vested interest in making it seem like it's mysterious, right? That, that actually, that it really is a question of like who is responsible, 
you know, and they're dealing with policymakers who don't understand the technology well enough to really push back on that. Right? It's, it's, I'm really fundamentally puzzled by this question. Right? If you build a self driving car, if you're Waymo <laughs> or Google and you build a self driving car, and that car is responsible for killing somebody, uh -huh. right? Then you are responsible. Right now, maybe if there was a driver in there and you had something about how the driver had to pay attention, the driver could be jointly responsible, but you are not off the hook if it was driving under the control of your algorithm. I mean, that's how it should be, but I think they've done a very good job of obfuscating their responsibility and turning it into this question of like, well, I don't know, the black box and you know, there's such a complex system and da da da. And it's like, no, don't let them do that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and we have Paul Fournier who's writing, uh, I think that the problem is that our legal and regulatory systems in society are mostly based on taking action after harm has been proven. It is very difficult to regulate anything without showing harm as being done. The good bad news is that we are close to being able to prove harm from AI systems at this point. Jan, anything to add on, on trust and responsibility? Um, not much. I totally agree with what Brigitte and Jason mentioned earlier. Uh, I, I just posted in the chat, there is this example of Waymo who is uh, now testing, I mean, not testing, it's actually rolling out driver-less taxis in Phoenix in the uh, USA. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I didn't do a study, I'm, I'm not a lawyer also, but apparently they don't mention anything about responsibility. <laughs> so, mm. they, so I don't know what happened if there is any accident with such a taxi because they are really driverless. It's, it's not like there is someone inside who has to take responsibility. Those taxis, as far as I understand, there is no driver and no human uh, in the loop. Mm -hmm. So I have no idea what happens if there is an accident. Yeah, yeah. It's very unclear. It's very unclear from the articles. But uh, Guylaine, maybe I have a question to, uh, to the answer uh, provided by uh, Jason or his comments. That is, yes, you can say that um, uh, Google is responsible for the uh, accidents, but on the other hand, uh, you know, it amounts to, uh, to prove that uh, you have thought of all possible cases uh, so that you guarantee there will be no accident. So I believe it's more reasonable that uh, Google could say that, okay, I can uh, be sure that in uh, X many percent of the cases, maybe 99%, there will be a no accident, but you know, having a, a car that for which you can guarantee that the car will never be responsible, your autonomous car uh, mm -hmm. can, will never have any accident, uh, then I think we are not going to have any autonomous car if you want to have this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, but that's not the guarantee. That's not, that's not what I'm asking for. It's just that the 1% where it doesn't work, that they take responsibility for it. Oh, right. uh, okay. I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not saying he's be perfect. God knows. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Because none of it ever is, right? We never, we never do anything new. It's just that the system is, and it goes back to what Paul said, the system is, it's like, okay, we trust you to get this right most of the time, but the 1% of the time that you don't, you, act, you have to take responsibility for it. You don't get the point somewhere else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and I, that's why we, we hear sometimes about the researchers who are talking about uh, doing audit of the code of the algorithm to, uh, to, to analyze what the quality of, of that piece. Uh, before we go to the, uh, the, the, the question uh, as far as asking, uh, I'd like to ask you, how do you see the role of AI in higher education? What types of applications or services you you know or imagine would be interesting for a university like Concordia? Uh, so my thought about uh, that question could be that uh, maybe with the use of uh, AI uh, in the uh, context of the uh, engineering uh, training, we could provide uh, some uh, virtual uh, use cases which are close to closer to uh, reality. So the way we train uh, engineering uh, student today, uh, mostly it's uh, theoretical uh, studies. So you need to do internship if you really want to, to put hands on in a system. Uh, so if you think about uh, flight uh, simulator, 
so uh, companies, airline companies are using it to train their, uh, their pilots. So I believe that, uh, you know, you could provide a, a given number of uh, uh, case studies and uh, that would be a, a dynamic case studies. Huh? Hmm. Jan or Jason, what, what, what type of application do you see for the kind of organization we are? Do you see uh, AI, for example, in student advising? in uh, questions that are asked to, uh, you know, at the reference desk or uh, the chat reference. Is it, can, we, can, can you imagine that kind of, of services being uh, offered through uh, an AI type of, uh, of technology in the future? I believe that you can think about uh, question and uh, answers at the uh, library. The way that if you go to uh, to China uh, in some hotels, you know it's already uh, robots welcoming you. Now, uh, for sure, we can do it, but do we want it? That's that's the question. Yeah, yeah I think I mean particularly when we're you know at this moment of of Concordia, for instance, being mainly closed to on-site instruction, mm -hmm. right? It's like that's like this question of like why do people go to university? Right, and so if if more of your university experience sort of becomes automated, why do you actually come here to this space? You know, if I'm going to go to the library and like get served by robots, why do I actually need to be presently, phys you know, physically present in the library? Because a big part of the reason, as we all know, you know, that we do this thing where we bring people to this place is all the human interaction, you yeah. know, that occurs. Yeah. So yeah, I think that um, you know I, I don't I don't personally don't have any great ideas beyond the usual sort of kind of you know automate automation of like mundane tasks you know type of thing uh, because I do think that part of the value proposition of a university is human interaction uh -huh. because otherwise people can do a ton of it online yeah right so that, I think that's a you know I think that's an interesting conundrum that we are all going to face over the next 10 and 15 years, um, that kind of, that sort of tension. Yeah, it, it's certainly a question that we, uh, I think we need to continue to, to, to talk among ourselves because uh, you know, vendors are already starting to knock at our doors. But the question is also about what kind of data does uh -huh. the university process? I mean, do, do we have, uh, as a university, do we have such amount of data that it will warrant using machine learning or AI systems to, to find patterns in this data. Mm -hmm. So there might be, might be uh, again, I'm very like Jason, I don't have any great idea. Maybe there could be something about, you know, finding patterns in how students, uh, how the, the grades of students uh, vary across the year, across the, the disciplines. But, you know, I mean, we need a we need lot of data to, to build a meaningful machine learning system. So the question would be, what kind of data is the university to offer? Yeah, to use? So. yeah that's the starting point. That's, uh, we clearly understood that from the conversation today. So maybe the last question, as far as asking, adequate data is key factor for AI success, as mentioned so many times today. We are, uh, so are things getting better to overcome typical challenges in data collection? For example, during COVID pandemic, those of us who tried to develop some automated diagnosis solution found it difficult to avail real patient data. So what do you think? What Are things getting better to overcome typical challenges in data college? Uh, I think it depends on the area. Uh, I believe that um, uh, uh, the companies, uh, if we are talking about, uh, let's say, SMEs, uh, even big companies, they are uh, becoming aware of the fact that AI comes uh, with adequate data, clean data. Now for the uh, health uh, sector, it's, uh, it's more difficult. Uh, I would say at least for two reasons. One, because you have to manipulate uh, uh, sensitive data, real uh, personal data. And uh, of course, you have to, uh, to be careful with that and follow some uh, protocol. 
and also the, 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 the quantity of data is uh, not uh, necessarily uh, there depending on what you want to do in the uh, diagnosis. So uh, of course, if you are talking about uh, COVID today, but uh, so I, uh, I try to be involved in some uh, COVID project, um, but you know, the, the people who, who can collect those data, they are busy doing something else today, <laughs> caring about the patients. So uh, there, there are certainly uh, collections of uh, data for the COVID today, but uh, it's not the top priority. I mean, you, in the hospitals, uh, as uh, everybody knows, there is a shortage of, uh, of people to uh, take care of uh, the patients. So uh, I think it's difficult. Um, so yes, there are, uh, in conclusion, yes, there are uh, progress with respect to, to the data, but there are still uh, a long way to go, especially in the uh, health uh, sector. Thank you, Brigitte. Uh... Jason or Jan? Well, I, I, would, <laughs> I would say that the communities that I work with are actually in some ways purposely making their data harder to collect, uh -huh. right? Because there's a long history of data being collected from indigenous communities um, and then uh, sort of monetized, not only monetized to not to their benefit, but actually sold back to them, you yeah. know, at a high cost. And also the data has historically been used to justify all sorts of crazy scientific discriminations, science-based discriminations. Anyways, there's a, there's a, there's, there's a very kind of deep-seated, I think, wariness about data collection that, that, you know, we don't buy into this. That, you know, I think in Western cultures, you know, we, we try to promote this idea that, uh, you know, any data that you share is going to be used for the good of all mankind, you know, particularly if it's health data, right? But that historically has not been true for us. And, you know, and we can see now with sort of the kinds of inequalities we have in North America, that that's not true for other people too, right? So, so I think that's a really interesting question. And, it, and, it's, and, it's, and it's too bad because as I said in the opening, one of the problems is, is that small populations like ours are not adequately represented in the data. Yeah. particularly the health data, yeah. right? And so there's this tension there between wanting to be adequately represented so the systems are built to better address the needs that come up in our populations, but at the same time, having this very well-grounded um, wariness and skepticism about how that data will be used. So I think trying to find a way through that is, 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 a, is a super high priority for, I think, a lot of indigenous communities. Mm -hmm. And yeah, anything to add on challenges and data collection? Uh, not really. I, I totally agree. And, and I hope we are not using our companies or people will not be using the COVID-19 as an excuse to forego any regulation yeah. when collecting data. Because it's really important that we make sure that data is collecting in an ethical and, and lawful way. And uh, I, I've heard in some countries, not to mention the USA, that uh, you know, they are doing whatever because they want to, to build a vaccine, but it doesn't make any sense. And it's, it's actually jeopardizing the trust of the population for that vaccine and for that, uh, any, anything that will come out, any good even that will come out. So it's, 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 we have to be careful. I mean, as a society, but also as researchers, we have to be careful and make sure we follow proper ethical and, and regulatory uh, and, and to go back to what Jason, you told us uh, earlier, it's a, the responsibility to, uh, uh, to protect the data is not something that, is, uh, that stays only with the IT team. It's, it's, it's much more than that. It's each one of us, but also the, uh, the leaders of our organizations. So I think this is uh, bringing us to the end. Uh, to, oh yeah, I'm looking at the uh, question box. That was really interesting. But before we close, do you have any uh, uh, closing remarks that you would like to make? One of the three of you. It was already a very well, rich conversation. Well, yeah, this I'll just say this has been really productive for me. Um, being in conversation, both the conversation we did beforehand and this conversation too, because it, it has made me realize what I said earlier, but I think I might've like, you know, it, it got frozen, whatever, but you know, that I do think there's a real actual commonality of interest 
you know, between system builders and people who are concerned about how the systems are being used, you know, um, and in terms of how do we improve them, how do we involve them? And this conversation has been, you know, made me hopeful around that. And we had great questions from the participants. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was uh, pretty great. Uh, and I, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Prem Soria Kumar and Paul Fournier who uh, worked on the organization of this uh, round table. And certainly with Anna and, and Douglas from the fourth space. I have my D'Artagnan who joined us. <laughs> Because someone knocked at the door, sorry. It's the beauty of, uh, of the working from home. Over to you, Anna. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you. Well, firstly, thank you for your patience. As many of you know, we are dealing with a somewhat widespread uh, power outage here on the island, which A, prevented one of our panelists from joining us today and B, um, affected our own connection to some weird degree. So thank you, panelists, for being patient with the multitude of host pop-up messages throughout the past hour. I don't know, trick or treat, is it Halloween already? <laughs> don't... Anyhow, on behalf of all of us at Four Space, I would like to thank you very much for your time, Brigitte, Jason, Jan, for sharing your, your ideas and your thoughtful comments. A special thank you to Guylaine as well for your moderating uh, moderation expertise and to Paul Fournier, Digital Strategy Director and Prem Surya Kumar, Knowledge Broker in the Office of Research who worked to bring the Ask Us Anything About AI project to life. Thank you all as well, audience members for attending and for the great commentary in the chat. We really appreciate your participation. Before you go, if I could borrow just one more minute of your time and invite you to fill out a very short survey as you leave, uh, that would be very much appreciated. And a reminder that you'll be able to find the recording of today's um, session, I guess, conversation on our website, concordia.ca slash four. If you're uh, somebody who is on Facebook um, at cu 4 space you'll find it there as well. Again, have a great evening. I hope you all get your power back if you've lost it and can have something warm to eat because it's cold out there. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.